Good evening, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Our program from Resistance to Resilience will be is beginning shortly. This is the first in a three-part series on mental health in our community, where we will be addressing the issues surrounding mental health and mental illness through three distinct lenses. Tonight, we will address how socioeconomics and trauma play a role in mental health, particularly in African-American communities and within the recent context of mounting public health and political crises. I wanna thank each of you for being here for this important conversation. We have over 130 people on who are listening as of now. Recent events have made it clear that the need for civil conversation and dialogue that moves us forward is more important now than ever. In fact, many would say that the fate of our democracy depends on our ability to engage with one another despite differences of opinion. American Public Square is committed to our mission of improving the tone and quality of public discourse to help our community meaningfully address society's most perplexing issues. We rely on the support of members to do this. And to those of you who are already APS members, we wanna thank you. Those of you that are not members, I hope you're gonna consider joining today because thanks to a generous gift from the h &R Block Foundation, we're making a special offer available to you tonight. Anyone who signs up for a membership between now and the 31st of July will receive a second membership to gift to a friend. You can learn more about membership and take advantage of this special offer at our website, www.americanpublicsquare.org. We have partnered with Kansas City Public Library on fact checking for our program tonight. Jenny Starr, who compiled tonight's fact sheet, is a health and wellness specialist on the community reference team at the Kansas City Public Library. She is also our fact checker for this evening's event. And you can access tonight's fact sheet on our website at AmericanPublicSquare.org. Additionally, special appreciation goes to our presenting sponsors, the City of Kansas City, Missouri, the Hall Family Foundation, H&R Block Foundation, Sue Seidler and Lewis Nerman, FlexPod, and our partner, William Jewell College. Denisha Snell, APS's program manager, will serve as your roving reporter for tonight's program. As always, during American Public Square programming, we welcome questions from the audience. Denisha will be watching for any questions you may have for our panel. Please feel free to, you, to type those into the Q&A section of Zoom. To request a fact check, please utilize the same process for, as for asking questions. Just be sure to signify that you're requesting a fact check instead of a question. If you're watching on Facebook, you may also ask your question by posting in the comments section. It is now my privilege to introduce tonight's panel moderator, Jana Calkins, the assistant news editor at Fox 4 News, Kansas City, Missouri. Alan, thank you so much. And, and a big welcome to all of those of you who took time out of your evening to join this important conversation on mental health. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this conversation. And as your moderator, my goal is to engage in a balanced dialogue with our panelists. I'd like to introduce them to you now. I start with Dr. Dennis Carpenter, who is the CEO and president at Aspirational Insights Consulting. Also joining us this evening is Kiana Thomason, the president and CEO of the Health Forward Foundation. And our third panelist this evening is Denise Long. Denise is the Director of Organizational Development and Applied Research at Alive and Well. You can find each of these panelists' um, extended biographies on the American Public Square website, along as Alan mentioned with tonight's fact sheet and health, mental health resource information. Because mental health is so important to all of us, we do want to remind you that if you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts or is in a mental health crisis, um, they can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number is 1-800-273-8255. They have trained crisis managers available to give you hope and help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So tonight's conversation focuses on some tough topics, but we know it's important to dig in and see what we can do to promote the conversation and look for solutions in our community. We're going to begin by kind of setting a definition. What is trauma and how does someone know if they have been traumatized? Denise, could we start with you and a little bit of your thoughts on that conversation? 
Absolutely, Allison. Thank you. Um, so as we think about trauma, we really define it as an event or series of events that overwhelms a person or group or community's ability to cope. And when I say cope, what I'm really talking about is their ability to show up and function in a healthy and productive way in their roles and responsibilities, as well as in terms of managing the relational and relationship demands that are relevant to those roles and responsibilities. Um, it's really important as we're talking about trauma to really understand um, the connection between trauma and adversity. Um, and as we're thinking about trauma, we know that there needs to be adversity in order for trauma to happen. We think that there needs to be, we know that there needs to be an event that is negative that under ideal circumstances, we wouldn't want any developing person to experience. They need to make meaning of that event, which is often a subconscious thing. People just are pattern makers and we make sense of things. We internalize things that aren't our burden to bear. So if I'm a child who is let's say abused by my father, I might think that, you know, I am abused by him because I'm not lovable enough. I'm not good enough, smart enough, good at the right sports, those types of things. And trauma is also about the effect that that has on my life and development, my ability to make relationships, my ability to function. Diana, do you have some thoughts to add to that as well? No, I think um, Denise encapsulated it very well. I think um, the, all I would add is that many times people think of trauma as an attack, a rape, a natural disaster. But as Denise mentioned, there are um, adverse experiences and our adversities in our everyday lives uh, that can cause traumatic experiences. Um, hunger uh, is traumatic uh, to a child. Uh, having uh, a parent who's imprisoned is traumatic to a child. Um, the oppression of bullying, is a, it, the oppression of racism, all that's traumatic. And so I think when we think about trauma, we have to think about it holistically and integratively in all of the realms of our experiences and domains of life. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis, can you talk a little bit about what the correlation is in your experience? You've worked in suburban, urban school districts. You've had a, a wealth of experience there. What's the correlation that you've seen between trauma and one's socioeconomic status? Wow, so when you think about trauma through a socioeconomic lens, you think about to be diagnosed or not to be diagnosed. So for example, when I've spent significant time in urban settings, we are hesitant to have conversations about trauma we'd rather have conversations about behaviors and the actions of the person that's experiencing the trauma. When we get into more suburban and more affluent places, man, we have quick diagnosis of trauma. We, we, we don't get into that behavioral element. And so that is in and of itself systemically problematic. And we see evidence of that because once you make a determination in which you define as trauma or you define as behavioral, then that takes this child down a totally different path in terms of how that trauma is presented to society, how that trauma is supported by our society. So until we are able to have the same conversation in both places, this whole thing about trauma just continues to be inequitable. One of the things I've heard a, a speaker say at some point, and I wish I could remember to, to give them proper credit, is the difference between the question, what's wrong with you versus what happened to you to help understand. Um, Denise, is that something that you see as being part of that conversation Dennis was explaining about? Yeah, the yeah absolutely. It's about uh, shifting the question so that we can understand why people are showing up the way that they are. And we ask that question to ourselves as relational partners, right? The reason we wanna shift the question is because a lot of times when people have uh, stress responses, that fight, flight, freeze response that people have, all of us have, 
when we <clears throat> feel psychologically or physically threatened is because our relational partners experience us as inconvenient, uncooperative, and things like that. And if we stop with the analysis at what's wrong with you, we don't understand that something has happened that has caused the person to have a very natural automatic response when they felt threatened uh, psychologically or physically. So that shift in question from what's wrong with you to what's happened is something we pose to ourselves as relational partners in order to be more empathetic, in order to respond more compassionately. And something else that Dr. Carpenter said I wanted to speak to is that <clears throat> we don't ask the question to other people for several reasons. Sometimes people don't even know. They don't have the words to explain the thing, right? But we as relational partners who haven't felt like we've been attacked because a customer, we caught the short end of a customer's upset. If we can understand that something really is going on, that person's very disappointed and I can depersonalize it, what happened that would cause that person to speak to me in this way, I can respond empathetically. That person might not be able to explain to me that, you know, well, you know, my husband and I got into a significant fight last night and it was about money again and all of this history historical stuff that really does drive our behavior in different moments. So we ask the question so we can be empathetic, knowing that people can't always explain to us what's going on with them. That makes sense. Kiana, would you like to add some thoughts on that? Well, you know, um, I think they both covered it well in the realm of uh, social uh, determinants of health or socioeconomic status. There are so many factors that are involved. Uh, you have housing, education, uh, food and nutrition, our physical environments where we often see uh, concentrated poverty. Uh, whenever you have concentrated poverty, um, you often have concentrated areas of violence or crime. Uh, and you have uh, generations of people who are overexposed uh, to that, uh, to witnessing that level of trauma. From a crime uh, perspective, we know here in Kansas City, uh, we are among the top five um, areas uh, or states in our country uh, with respect to murders and gun violence. So Kansas City is particularly challenged um, in uh, its urban core, but it's a Kansas City issue, not necessarily just an urban core issue. But all of those realms of housing, education, nutrition, um, any adverse experiences in those areas are certainly or can certainly be uh, traumatic. I will say when you're dealing with uh, having to rob Peter to pay Paul as a family, um, living up under that chronic stress causes what's called oxidative stress in the body. And when oxidative stress sets in the body, it, it attacks or causes an imbalance between free radicals and our antioxidants that fight those free radicals. So when that imbalance is present, then our bodies are more susceptible uh, to chronic disease, which is why we often see um, a disproportionate impact in health injustices in diabetes and heart disease. It also causes obesity when oxidative stress is present, uh, and it certainly causes a significant air, uh, mental health issues around depression uh, and imbalances in general. Isn't that interesting to talk about the science of what our bodies do when we're under stress and under trauma? Um, before we transition to kind of the next phase, I think that gives us a really nice baseline of understanding for trauma and kind of the conversation that we're gonna dig into this evening. I do wanna check in with Denisa Snell, our roving reporter, to see if we've had panelists, or excuse me, uh, participants participants this evening who have questions of the panel at this point. Good evening. So um, we have a question about um, ACE and what ACE stands for and what that means. And in the context of mental health, what does that look like in our community? And remember, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A uh, portion or on Facebook, uh, put them in the comment section. Thank you. Great, I have to acknowledge that um, I first heard of the acronym ACEs when we had our planning call about a week ago. So um, I'm new at learning some of this. Maybe some of you haven't heard of that either, but Kiana, can I come back to you for an explanation of some of the different um, definitions that there are for that acronym? 
Sure, and I will definitely lean on my panelist here because I think Denise is actually the expert. Uh, but we have adverse childhood experiences, some of which uh, she described and I described earlier um, with respect to abuse, um, hunger, those types of things. Um, you have adverse community experiences when you have a community who lives in marginalized conditions. Um, note that I did not say marginalized people, but people who live in marginalized conditions where we have disinvestment in communities uh, whereby folks are oppressed uh, and have to make choices based off the choices they have. Uh, and then you also have adverse clinical experiences where oftentimes segments of our population and especially African Americans um, don't have the same experience in clinical settings as our white counterparts do that results in trauma and a significant host of health disparities. Um, there was a, a, a study uh, in Philadelphia that looked at, I don't know, out of maybe 15 to 20 ACEs. I'm going to pitch it to Denise because I think she's the expert here and can speak more uh, about that. So thank you. That, that was beautifully stated. Absolutely. So there are a constellation of adversities that contribute to well-being and illness, right, that you very eloquently laid out. When we talk about adverse childhood experiences, we're really talking about um, the negative that's introduced into life or the withholding what, of what everyone needs in order to thrive. Notice I said thrive and not just survive, right? So those events that are negative to development that happen between birth and 18, that acronym really comes from the original ACEs study, which was a partnership between Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It was completed with some 15 some odd thousand people in total um, over time. It was published actually in the late 90s, I believe in 1998. You know, Jenna, you talk about not hearing about it. I'm an occupational therapist. I graduated from Mizzou, which is one was at that time and probably still now one of the best occupational therapy programs um, in the country, based in the medical school, we never talked about ACEs, right? Um, and so even after that, in earning my master's and all of that, we never talked about ACEs. Even as a clinician, we never talked about ACEs. I heard about adverse childhood experiences when I was studying resilience in order to address and understand how to work with my clients as well as how to work with my own family. So ACEs are really about what happens at between birth and 18 and the effects that that can have on your life, which we can talk about a little bit more about the ACEs study. Great, that's a lot to soak in. Um, how, how are all of these ACEs, we talked a little bit about it in terms of hunger and some of the other things. Um, Dr. Carpenter, what's your experience about how one's socioeconomic status impacts their likelihood to have more than one ACE um, yeah. quantity? I, I'm not sure I'm using the right term there, but no, no. About how that socioeconomic impact uh, Absolutely. So the Kaiser Permanente study that's been referenced, it really talks about the number of ACEs that a child experiences before age 18. And as that number increases, the likelihood of that child thriving minus some level of direct intervention, it just decreases and decreases. So when you think about ACEs, they really fall into three categories. They are the area of abuse, the area of neglect, and the area of household dysfunction. So when you think about abuse, you can think about that in a sexual way, in a physical way, in an emotional way. And then when you think about neglect, that's both physical and emotional. And then when you think about all of those elements that are household dysfunction, whether that be an incarcerated relative. So we don't have to make this stuff up, whether that be parents experiencing divorce, whether that be a mother or father being treated violently in the home. And you can literally count these aces up. So when you count these ACEs, if a child does not get what he or she needs during that birth to age 18 and they're these ACEs, the chance of them thriving is gonna be slim to none. That's why when we say we haven't had this conversation, especially in a place called school, it's problematic because a child can improve from the experience of ACEs in, the, in their upbringing. But they cannot improve if we don't acknowledge that and we say we give every child the same thing. If we're just going to give everybody the same thing, regardless of the number of ACEs they show up with, 
then that's problematic. And unfortunately, that does harm to our black, brown, and poor children in a place called school because just waking up every day and falling into one of those categories is an ace in and of itself, oftentimes. I, I'd like to uh, clarify, and thank you for that, Dr. Carpenter, to name those 10 uh, adversities that were that came out of the original ACE study. So we also talked about the Philadelphia Urban ACE study. They called it the Expanded ACE study. And what that study did is it oversampled for Black folk who were underrepresented, relatively speaking, in the original ACE study. And it also looked at urban environments and it added several ACEs. And those ACEs that they took a look at, again, those adverse childhood experiences, were look, really looking at community level adversity, whereas the original ACE study looked at the household. But but we know that our children and no one really only develops in their household. We grow up in communities that are nested within a regional context, the state context, and then a national context and narrative, right? So those ACEs that they added were witnessing violence, feeling discriminated against, living in an adverse neighborhood, um, where you are feeling people don't look out for each other, you're feeling unsafe, having experienced bullying, and also having lived in foster care placement, which we know that Black youth are overrepresented in foster care. And we also know that Black parents and Black mothers especially are more likely to lose their children to foster care placement than are their non-Black counterparts who have, who are living in similar or even worse household conditions. So if we're going to talk about adversity, if we're going to talk about socioeconomic status, we have to racialize all of this because we also know that in the United States context, you can't separate race from really anything that we do. It's the water that we swim in. And when I say race, what I really mean is racism and color related. Uh, racism, anti-black being on the extreme and then white being on the polar where we get protection, if that makes sense. It does. Dana, I'll, Go ahead. I'll just add really quickly, I love the fact that um, Denise and Dr. Carpenter are deeply steep, steeped in, um, in adept and adverse childhood experiences. Um, my realm in the realm of Health Forward Foundation is uh, to address uh, and promote uh, issues uh, or opportunities that promote quality health and eliminate barriers to health. And one of those inequities around health are the adverse clinical experiences that I spoke of earlier. These adverse clinical experiences are not oftentimes about socioeconomic status, but they are about racism. And that black and brown individuals um, are treated much differently with respect to pain and pain management. Um, and with respect to um, uh, being medically disregarded oftentimes in clinical settings. We see this bear out uh, in um, many uh, different metrics with respect to population health, uh, but where it is uh, highlighted right now and at issue in a national conversation is around um, maternal mortality. So uh, black women um, die during their childbearing years around childbirth uh, pre and postpartum at four times the rate of our white counterparts. Even when socioeconomic status is controlled for among those black women, they still die at four times the rate, which means that the narrative about, oh, they're poor, they didn't have prenatal care, um, they couldn't, they didn't have coverage. We eliminate that and we have to change the narrative because of that research and decenter socioeconomic status as the issue for mm -hmm. the uh, quadruple representation in maternal mortality among black women and center racism as the culprit of that uh, mortality metric for black women. Uh, and we see the same in infant mortality. You can look at Wyandotte County's HEAT report, H-E-A-T acronym HEAT report, that looked at infant mortality where you saw about three times the rate uh, for uh, black and brown infants in that county compared uh, to other counties in the state. So uh, racism is also uh, an, a culprit um, around trauma and adverse clinical experiences just as much as socioeconomic status. Those are really staggering numbers to try to absorb. Um, so 
what I hear you saying is that while we know that poverty itself can be a driver for trauma, we also need to be looking at the systemic issues that are causing um, black Americans or brown Americans to be treated in the clinical setting in a different way than their non, um, non or their white counterparts would, would be. Um, Correct. Wow, okay. Um, I think we'll take another break and see if Denisha has some questions coming in from the participants this evening. Yes, I do. We have a Facebook participant who has asked, what is the next step for Kansas City around health? Uh, we know the preconditions, uh, most are owning them, but what are our next steps? So, I, that's I, I, a, no, no, you go ahead, go ahead. Uh, that's a very broad question uh, with respect to health. Um, there's a, a lot of areas and angles uh, we can take on that. Uh, first, we need to make sure that um, all people who are living in poverty, uh, and particularly African Americans and black and brown communities have access to care. So we have an opportunity uh, called the Medicaid expansion uh, on August 4th to consider as Missourians to make sure that individuals who are living in poverty have basic access to mental health, physical health, and oral health by expanding Medicaid. So that's one low-hanging fruit opportunity for us um, in this state. Uh, another opportunity is to make sure that we are holding our healthcare systems and leaders accountable um, at every level around addressing systemic racism uh, in their systems uh, and addressing conscious, unconscious bias and racism that shows up in clinicians and that also shows up in the algorithms and in the laboratory uh, reports that um, oftentimes drive clinical decision making. Um, we need to make sure that social determinants or I prefer to say social influencers of health are, are part of the medical model. So we are past, um, long time past physicians treating folks within a clinical context and not looking at their community context, their neighborhood context. So ensuring that social influencers of health are part of the clinical care, standard of care uh, for care delivery. Um, there's a, a list, I could go on and on, uh, but those things are top of mind. Excellent, Denise, you look like you might have something to add there. Yeah. So I was given the, the, the snap. <laughs> snap all you want, I'll pick up on it. Well, that too, but I'd also like to add that, so as we think about wellness, we have to extend that beyond the healthcare system. There are everything that Kiana said, plus the long list that I know she has because she's an expert in this area of actions that healthcare systems and healthcare practitioners need to take. We also need to know that health doesn't just happen or isn't just determined by my interaction with my physician, my nurse, the receptionist. It happens in the context of my living. Right. So the inequity that I experience in the healthcare system also happens at the post office. It happens at the restaurant. It happens at the drugstore that I visit, at the convenience store. It happens everywhere. When we're talking about Black folks and the fact that Black people in America have <clears throat> more residual stress measured cortisol in their body than do other people, than do Black people who immigrate here for a while. But then once they're here for a while, they start to show similar stress markers as Black Americans who've been here, right? And so again, it's not the race, it's the racism and the environment in which people are operating. So what happens in, what needs to happen in Kansas City needs to happen everywhere. Everyone needs to become versed in and fluent about race and racism. We need to pull it out. It's the elephant in the room. Let's shine a light on it. Let's digest it, what it means, and let's start listening to black folk because we've been living with it for a while we've been talking about it for a long time we're subject matter experts when it comes to what the system needs to do in order to quit to stop harming us um and we need to just get out of the shame and fear game if we're going to all get well it feels like um the events of the last few weeks may have they've obviously created a lot of trauma and a lot of hard feelings and difficult conversations in our communities, 
but it also feels like there's a ripeness for opportunity and change and maybe people are um, feeling like it's time to dig into this a little bit, lean into the difficult conversations. Um, and that kind of helps us pivot to the next phase of our discussion, which is uh, related to the atrocities that we've seen against Ahmaud Arbery, against Breonna Taylor, certainly the George Floyd um, video. Um, but there's also a concern that the coverage and the repeated um, airing of those videos or sharing on social media can create um, a secondary trauma. Um, Kiana, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, so secondary trauma is a thing. You can experience trauma uh, vicariously. Uh, trauma is often passed down um, as um, an infamous legacy in the African-American community um, because of our experiences from lynching um, to, uh, from slavery to lynching, um, to um, the uh, murders of our black men and women on our streets and in our homes. Um, and so we oftentimes, um, we know these stories, okay? They're happening to our brothers, our sons, our nephews, our uncles. We talk about these stories. And so for us, um, the, the George Floyd, when we see George Floyd being asphyxiated and murdered, we see our child. We see our father. When I think about Ahmaud Arbery, my brother runs in Johnson County, which is the most affluent and wealthiest county in Kansas. He runs every day. I saw my brother when I saw Ahmaud Arbery. So it is indeed traumatic, and we have to relive it all the time. Um, it's unfortunate that mainstream America is now having to experience the trauma that we've all experienced for many, many years. So really, to break it down even further, what we're talking about with vicarious or secondary trauma seems to be you're not the person that the thing, the bad thing, the traumatic experience happened to, but by learning about it, seeing it happen, you can also experience that kind, a different kind of trauma um, in addition to the person who was victimized, if you will. So Yeah, so you may not experience it personally, but you are experiencing experiencing it. It's to the point where I cannot, for my own well-being and the well-being of the people around me, watch another Black man be murdered. I cannot watch another child get rolled upon in a park playing with the gun and be murdered because I think about the times that my child has been outside playing with the gun. Um, and to Kiana's point, it is to the point in America where every time this happens. It happens to all of us, right? And here's the added trauma to that. How many more of us got to die before everybody else gets as upset as we are? I'm going to tell you that the bad feelings have been around for a minute. I'm pissed off. And I'm not going to lie about the fact that I'm angry. And if you ain't angry, you ain't paying attention. Or you are attempting to cope with that trauma, that upset, and the insanity of it all by disconnecting, by dis by um, hypo, being hypo aroused and down regulating yourself so that you don't get upset, so that you can still function. It is infuriating to have to ask how many more, right? How many more in this generation have to die? And how many more generations, because we've been having this conversation for a minute plus, right? And we've been saying the same things and the same things have been happening. People stand around and watch a Black person die. Black people get neglected in healthcare and die. How many more? So what I want to add to that as it relates to trauma and the incidents of, of today, and Jana, you talked about the community, or it may be right now, to further this conversation. And the fact that it took George Floyd with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds for the time to get ripe is traumatic to me as a black man. So it's traumatic to me that we have not heard these voices for 40 plus years, 450 plus years, I'm sorry. 
And it's also traumatic to me that people that call themselves my colleagues and my friends see this happening to black bodies in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, and they've sat for years and said nothing. So I'm wondering, I tell people that I'm cautiously optimistic about the mood of today around this work in this conversation, but I also know enough about white solidarity to say that I'm cautiously optimistic. Because what worries me about white solidarity is Ben and Jerry came out with a statement, and then the next firm came out with a statement, and then Nike made a commercial, and then my next door neighbor painted Black Lives Matter on the sidewalk. So what I'm worried about is, are those with the social capital to affect change around race, i.e. white folks, are they responding out of duty and not wanting to fall out of white solidarity, or did white folks really finally get it? So that's something that I'm keeping my eyes on and it's very, very traumatic for me. I can understand that. Um, I know that I was a little bit overwhelmed. I've been in the TV news business for 25 years and this past weekend went back and watched the special that CBS did um, on race last week. And they were telling, retelling the story of Amadou Diallo and I couldn't believe that that had been more than 20 years. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, has it really been that amount of time that we've been having these similar conversations? And certainly cases before that. Um, so your point's well taken. Um, one of the other things that we talked about in our um, planning call was how those of us who are white, whether we're coming to the conversation for the first time and kind of having this awakening or this uh, reckoning and realizing that there needs to be a conversation, all of us turn to our black American friends. Um, what can we do? How can we help? Um, and that in and of itself can be exhausting for those of you who've had to have this conversation your entire careers, your entire lives. Um, Denise, can you speak a little bit to that? <laughs> I know you're grateful for the question and for somebody who wants to be an ally in this uh, conversation. Yeah. But well, she better go there because if she doesn't, I will. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get you both I know you got, I I know you got it, so Dr. Carter, you get it. <laughs> so, we have time so for that conversation. Thing. So here's the thing. I, I'm gonna be real with you because those who know me know that that's how I roll. I have no white friends who would do that to me. And here's the thing. I made a conscious choice to clean out my social circle. And for my own well-being, after what me and my family went through regarding racism, I could not have people in my space, black, white, or other, who were not actively and passionately advocating for my best interest. So here's what happened among my white friends. I found out about um, George Floyd from a white friend who texted me and said, I am so sorry about all the ish that's happening in America right now. What are you talking about? I was cooking dinner and he let me know. Again, I looked into that. I had another, and we had a conversation as we often do. He didn't ask me what he needed to do. He was telling me what he was continuing to do. A white girlfriend of mine from California called me and said, hey, I know I'm not supposed to call you asking what I need to do. And that's, what that, that's not what this call is about. I think that we need to use our power to make stuff happen. I'm gonna run some ideas around you. I trust your judgment because I know you do this work. So let me know what I'm missing as we thought partner together. That felt very different to me than my hair is on fire. I don't know how to handle this. And here's what I say to those folks. It's that Matthew McConaughey moment where imagine this were happening to white women and black men were running around the country. Is it four hours or nine hours now that a black man is shot unarmed, right? Imagine, what would you do? Who would be the first person you would call? How would you coalesce? your power and privilege to make that stop. Not next generation, because that wouldn't happen. You make sure that mess was stopped by the end of the week. I need you to bring that same energy to advocating for Black folks. Yeah, so, so it, it elevates itself from being 
an ally because an ally will pat you on the back and tell you that they're thinking about you. And if there's anything I can do, let me know. You know, we've heard that I'm praying for you. We've heard that if there's something I can do for you, let me know. We've heard that I'm thinking about you. Maybe that's an ally, but we're at a point in this particular moment and moving forward where I'm probably not going to have people in my space that aren't willing to be co-conspirators in this work. Put another way, bring your talents, bring your power, and bring your resources to the table. You see what I need. It's on display every day what I need. Show up as a co-conspirator in this work. And, and this trauma has been very, very perplexing as we watch these stories unfold. Because I tell you something else that causes irreversible trauma. It's hearing Black folks who've been so traumatized by this system that we call the United States making excuses and creating reasons for the suffering that's placed upon black bodies. So it was just this week that Rashard Brooks was shot in Atlanta. I'm no law enforcement official, so I'm not going to debate the legal merits. But what I do know is I saw a black father who had just taken his daughter to get her hair and her nails done and all of these things and ordered the bouncy house. And he knew that there was a party coming up for his favorite girl, his eight-year-old, on Sunday. And my guess is, after 45 minutes of watching him and an officer have a pretty pleasant conversation, there was an opportunity to provide some community policing and stop some trauma from happening in the life of a family. But we didn't take that opportunity. And then lo and behold, here I look on the news today, and the sheriff in the town that I grew up in, African-American male, a sheriff that along with myself went to high school with Ahmaud Arbery's mom, Wanda Cooper. He called the shooting justified. A black male, so he's all over national news today calling the shooting justified. And you don't know the calls I've gotten about the trauma that that's evoked in a black community that just voted him in and he went in two weeks ago with 82% of the vote. So when Ms. Thomason talks about holding leaders accountable, this is one of those moments where leaders have to be held accountable. And we're not just going to support you blindly when you do things that you know are landing on our bodies with destruction and harm, and you know the ecosystem is not right providing the support that needs to be provided. And so that's taxing as well as we think about this through a racial lens. And, and as you're saying, that's the leadership, whatever they look like, whether that's Black Americans, Brown Americans, White America, um, in those leadership positions, stepping up and being willing to put in the sweat equity to make a change. Kiana, I want to get an opportunity for you to weigh in on that as well before we uh, go to Denise. Yeah. To see about more so questions. two things. Um, lead from where you are um, with respect to showing up uh, to be a comrade with us in this fight and a co-conspirator, because this is indeed a fight. This is a fight for our very lives. Um, so show up in, in your sphere of influence uh, from uh, a, a policy perspective, uh, wherever you are, policies, practices, procedures, wherever you work, we need white folk to show up and apply a racial equity lens to every decision that's being made. Um, so from, you know, classrooms to boardrooms to, to, to ballot boxes, wherever you are, use your sphere of influence. The second thing is, um, white people need to know that we are exhausted and we are traumatized. Being able just to go to work every day uh, without shedding tears during these past few months, and I, I didn't quite make it. I shed a few at work, my team can tell you. Um, but um, it, it's exhausting, we're traumatized. One thing that um, I'm resentful about is the fact that we have to know you as white people. We have to study your whiteness. We have to know how you think. We have to know how you move. We have to um, anticipate your moves. We have to use strategy and be ninjas and gymnasts around whiteness. But you just want to ask us without doing your own research. 
It's not right. Don't place that burden on us. We're already traumatized. Thank you for making those points. I think um, those are important words for those of us who are not black or brown to hear. Um, maybe difficult words for some people and maybe a oh my gosh moment I didn't realize I was ever doing that to someone. Um, but it's a great example. We had a lot of conversations in our newsroom right after those um, particular events of the last few weeks happened about how we needed to stop talking as white people and listen a lot more um, and learn and understand. Um, so I think it's interesting um, that even though the intention on some people's part is not to evoke any trauma, um, just understanding that that is perhaps a really important takeaway. Um, before we move on to the next uh, section of our conversation, I want to turn things back over to Denisha uh, to see what questions our uh, guests are, are having pop up. I'm sure that uh, last section got us a lot of uh, conversation going. Thank you. Lots of questions, um, but I know that each one of you have a different um, specialty um, or a different focus area, but I think that this question is broad um, and it goes across each one of your, um, your focus areas. So it says, policy-wise, what steps do you see that need to be taken to interrupt the circle of violence? Well, I think, um, number one, um, someone else read that question because my alarm's about to go off and then I'll come back. Yeah, so, so I'm thinking about circle of violence and I'm trying to, and it's unfortunate as we talk about trauma, I'm thinking about which one? I'm thinking about which circle of violence because are we talking about police brutality? Are we talking about living in crime-ridden neighborhoods? Are we, talk about, are we talking about the spirit murdering and the educational violence that goes on in our school buildings? So as we unpack this notion of trauma, my first question is which one? And I think it all begins with looking at existing policy and seeing which, ones, which of those policies aid us into creating more equitable, more equal, more equitable systems. And then which of those policies that we have, regardless of the bureaucratic structure we are part of, which of those policies aid and abet white supremacy? And I think it can start with the existing policy. Let's just unpack those organizationally. Let's talk about the fact that we believe in diversity in our organization, but your organization still doesn't have any black folks. I mean, that's a starting point. Or maybe you go into and you say, we provide the same supports to every child regardless of which school because not doing so is unfair. Meanwhile, some schools thrive and other schools fail. Can we not agree that every child didn't enter the schoolhouse door at the same starting point? And if that is true, how can we create a more equitable system by way of policy? So when I think about the violence, because it all lands on our body in a visceral way. All of it lands on a black body or brown body in a visceral way. It's all violence. Yeah, I want to amplify everything that Dr. Carpenter said. And I have to tell you that as I'm getting to root cause analysis, right? If I had to choose a thing for us to do of the thousands of things that we could do. I would definitely say that implementing anti-racism in order to get its desired outcome of racial equity, where people get the things that they need, right? Um, that anti-racism would be it. And I say that because the following, when we look at poverty, especially black poverty, we have to know that it connects to 200 plus years of slavery. The reconstruction era that was intentionally disrupted by, <laughs> by Lincoln's vice president who turned over the federal government to the South, right? We have to know that the Jim Crow decades of it and the lynching era 
so to speak, between 1882 and the 1960s has affected Black wellness and wealth accumulation and the theft of Black farming when agriculture was the ways in which people made ends meet and provided for their families. We have to know that racism is at the root of what we call poverty, racialized poverty in America. So if I had to pick a thing, it would be anti-racism. And that needs to be implemented at the federal level. So when we talk about the competence of our legislators, if you ain't have the, uh, comfortable having this conversation as Denise, Dr. Con Dr. Carpenter, and Kiana are, then you maybe need to do some more study before you can write laws for a broken nation, right? So we have to also define competence as a way of addressing policy federally, statewide, locally, and institutionally as well. Who's qualified to do the job? Maybe this backs us up to too simple of a prospect, but one of the conversations that I've heard quite a bit in, in the recent weeks is the difference between a lot of white people saying, well, I'm not racist, and the difference between being not racist versus an anti-racist. Kiana, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, uh, saying you're not racist um, is um, really the equivalent to saying, you know, I love black people. I have best, best friends that are, that are black or I have friends that are black or um, I'm colorblind, which is highly offensive to a person of color because if you don't see my color, you don't see the contributions that my people have made nor the pain that we bear uh, to be here. So it's not enough. It doesn't go far enough to say I'm not racist. It is what are your daily actions, your daily behaviors and decisions that show up as anti-racist, taking a very declarative stance and being very clear when you see things, behaviors, practices, policies, procedures, that um, uh, support uh, uh, the oppression, uh, whether it be individually, community, uh, or systemically, structurally, of black and brown people. Many people um, are very jolted and pricked when they hear the term white supremacy culture. It's a term uh, that we use um, quite a bit now. When people hear that, they typically think skinheads, um, Nazis, but that's not what white supremacy culture is. White supremacy culture is simply centering whiteness and holding whiteness as the standard for everything in America. Um, as an illustrative, um, bringing it forward present day, Apple, um, the company who makes our phones and our computers, when they developed the um, facial recognition feature to unlock your phone, they did not test it with melanated skin. They only tested it with white people. So we had millions of black and brown people who had the means to buy the phone, um, had the phone, knew how to use the phone. We were told we were competent, but could not unlock the phone with the feature that we pay for. And so that is an example of how whiteness is centered and locks us out oftentimes from opportunity. That was not intentional by Apple. It wasn't. I don't believe it was. I don't believe it was. But that's an example of how we, that whiteness is the standard and we're, we're an afterthought and everything that is um, not white is, is, is bad or off center. So when you hear white supremacy culture, know uh, that we are talking about whiteness being the standard. So Ms. Thomason, let me add a little bit to that um, as it relates to Apple, because it builds on this notion of being an ally versus being a co-conspirator. Apple has some of the most sophisticated diversity, equity, and inclusion statements that a company can have. But I've walked the grounds in Cupertino, the old site and the new site. And there are just not a lot of black folks working for Apple and Cupertino. So it's one thing to have the words. It's another thing to have the actions that align with the words. 
And what we're seeing is a lot of statements and a lot of words. And now we're waiting to see if there are actions that are aligned. Because if the Apple campus that I walked on in Cupertino was more diverse, there would be diversity of thought. There would be diversity of intellect that, went in, that would have gone into the face recognition technology so that black folks didn't have to say, here we go again. <laughs> You know, Band-Aid just decided that they can, they can make their bandages a different color. Yeah. That they don't all have to be white skin tone. I'm finished. <laughs> no. Oh, I think, I think that's great. Um, Denise, go ahead. Yeah, so... I'm thinking about wellness and how, <clears throat> and so, right, we have to recognize that there's a history in this nation that really did start out black, native, and white, right? In terms of how this country formed. And it's evolved into a much more multicultural um, sort of place. Um, and when we talk about blackness, we know that we're talking about people who came from all over the continent of Africa, right? In order to create this thing that African Americans, particularly multi-generational African Americans are, right? Um, I think about technology as you shared and how black folks, multi-generational black folks, those who are descendants of slaves, who were here before it was legal, literally before it was legal before for black people to immigrate to America. So those folks are also left out of the equity equation and how that affects our mental health, right? So we know that people, white Americans in general, prefer black immigrants to black people because the history is not there. We also know that there is internalized racism, both superiority for white folks and people who are closer to white and skin tone and can access color privilege. We know that black people and people of color also oppress black people. And so when we talk about wellness and well-being and illness for black folk, especially dark skinned black folk like me, right? There is it comes from so many different places, including within our own community, including within the brown and black coalitions and the people of color coalitions. So when we talk about the violence and all of that, we also need to recognize the ways in which there is horizontal violence happening among oppressed people right, at the same time. So it's not just a black and white issue, it's also that proximity to whiteness among non-white people that creates violence. And that really leads to part of the conversation that we've talked about as well, toxic stress affecting physical and mental health. Um, Kiana, I know that you have a tremendous amount of um, experience with that. Um, do you wanna speak to that part a little bit? Well, I, I spoke a little bit about it earlier just with respect to oxidative stress and uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, you have the um, lower socioeconomic status that many um, African Americans uh, occupy in that uh, we far, um, far worse compared to our white counterparts with respect to economic mobility, education, housing, home ownership, all those types of things. Uh, and so when you, when you add on the layer of low socioeconomic status, low income, low wealth, um, violence in neighborhoods, uh, when you add on uh, the uh, trauma that comes from racism in different spaces and places that we are in, um, this is a cauldron of stress uh, in our bodies that creates illness, uh, cancers, chronic conditions, um, and of course has um, uh, uh, um, a relationship with our ability also to be able to thrive and grow wealth and grow income in our community. So it's a cycle. It, it, it's a cycle. So um, that is the relationship between health, mental health, uh, and, and, and trauma. 
Thank you. It seems like this is another good spot in the conversation to defer to Denisha and see what additional questions we have from those who are joining us online tonight. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in from Facebook. Um, this one says, what does Dr. Carpenter think about health as it relates to education? Um, and then another teacher, well, I'll let you answer that one first and then maybe you can come back to me for the next one. Health related to education? Yes. Wow, so it's, it's, I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think about that if a child comes to the schoolhouse door and their basic needs are not met, how do we expect them to thrive at this thing that we call learning? So once again, we have to create systems that are equitable. Put another way, if one school needs mental health supports, if one school needs additional nursing supports, it shouldn't be that every school gets a nurse if they have 300 kids. And when you get to 600, you get a second nurse. It has to do with the population that we're trying to serve and serve effectively. So I think health is necessary. Good health is necessary if a child's gonna thrive at this thing that we call learning and it's up to us to start impacting systems to do that well. We talk Medicaid expansion and yet another opportunity for Missouri to try to get this right because Missouri just seems to fail us in this area. So we're at it again in August. And Dr. Carpenter, you talked about this, uh, touched on it a little bit earlier about the difference between how schools treat children and, and define kids who have maybe been traumatized versus ones that they label as problem kids. Absolutely, so we have to do better. You know, when we think about diversity of thought and we think about diversity of intellect, um, we have to keep race on the table. Unfortunately, we have too many systems right here in our metropolitan area that simply there's an absence of leadership of color. And in those systems that try to introduce leaders of color, We've all seen how that works out in this metropolitan area. So it's a struggle in Missouri to, to get this right. And I think it all has to do with the ability to hear. You know, oftentimes when we think about white folks, especially white folks with means who influence systems, they've never had to listen to anyone else. But the true state of affairs is white folks have never had to be the masters of how to survive oppression, how to survive racism. The brain trust lies with people of color, how to survive inequity. That brain trust doesn't re reside with white folks. It resides with people of color. So when that absence is there, what you're saying to your communities and your families is that you care more about the status quo then you care about changing outcomes for certain kids. Not unlike we're hearing people that care more about property than they hear about a black life being left in the street. Somebody burned the Wendy's. Somebody burned the Wendy's. Or right. somebody looted a, a business or a building, yeah. I can't believe they looted. Never mind that King told us a long time ago that rioting is the voice of those who have no voice. He shared that with us a long time ago. And he gave us an expansive conversation about looting, but we don't ever refer to that from King. We, we just refer to, I have a dream. I have a dream. I wanted to chime in as well. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean to step on you there, Dr. Carpenter. I'm I know fine. Denise had some things she'd like to add. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. That's all right. I just had the sense that you wanted to get a comment in on that topic as well. No, everything that he said, it was, it was, um, it was all uh, very good, and I agree. Um, yeah. Denisha, there was a follow-up question you mentioned. Yes, we have lots of questions here this evening. So I'm actually gonna um, switch here pretty quickly over to uh, a question, another question about policy. Do you think making changes or adding new government policies would be effective in dealing with racism as a cause of illness? Um, they say it seems the government does a lot of studies and has all the data, but does not make the necessary changes to resolve these issues. That's a great question, and if I can speak to that one. Um, yes, the federal government 
pays for and funds an inordinate amount, a humongous amount, if I can use that word, of research, right, about best practices, promising approaches, what's happening at the community level, all of that kind of stuff, the new science, all of it. It will be very difficult for us to make progress and sustain that progress when every four to eight years, we can elect an administration that completely uproots, right? Up in the progress that had been pre previously made. So I also think about, again, root cause, right? The federal government, the states and local governments are directly responsible for the racial inequity that black folk especially are experiencing, did experience, and continue to experience in this country. Because what happened in the past is only the foundation for our present moment, right? And that's never been repaired. People have given apologies, but apologies not enough. We need actual repair. So a couple of things that I think need to happen. One, we need to shift this week, the people need to own this thing called a representative republic or democracy that has been given us, right? Where we elect people to do our work because we're busy doing the other stuff of the economy, right? Um, going to work, developing business, all that stuff. We have to take back our ownership of this thing. And we have to say, okay, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're an independent. What that means is it does not mean that you get to decide that you're going to neglect a large percentage of the American population. What that means is you're a Republican and you believe in fiscal conservatism. That's great. How are you going to take care of all of us? when you're practicing fiscal conservatism. So we have to shift this thing where people get to come into office and uproot our progress to you get to decide how to use your political party to take care of all of us. You don't get to decide which of us you are going to neglect. We have to shift that narrative because they're never gonna do it. And, and, and just to add a little bit to that, um... I'm thinking about the protesters and because there's a level of trauma associated with that. But what we're seeing is the rapid change that has come from protests. I have not seen this in my lifetime. I wasn't around in the sixties, but I am so inspired by the rapid change that's coming from protests. And you can Monday morning armchair quarterback it all you like, the proof is in the pudding. And so as we think about what Denise just said, I oh mean, I'm just, I just want to honor the protesters. I think we saw a microcosm of that happen in Kansas City. Um, the main protest started on a Friday evening and Friday and Saturday. Saturday was the evening that was probably the most violent in terms of um, damage being done to businesses in the plaza area. Um, and Sunday was, you know, a difficult night as well. Once the um, conversation took place between our Kansas City, Missouri mayor, Quentin Lucas, who is an African-American male, and our um, police chief, Rick Smith, um, there was a, a distinct pivot in the way that police handled the protesters, in the way that they allowed them to congregate, in the way that they continued to ticket. Um, people who were in violation. And I think those of us at least covering it and our people who were out on the street felt a distinct shift um, that was quite positive. Certainly everybody asked the questions, why couldn't that have happened a little bit sooner? Um, but then throughout all of that week, uh, two weeks ago, we continued to see protests. We continued to see um, signs of solidarity but the number of arrests dropped dramatically. And I feel like there was a little bit better of an understanding about the respect shown to those who wanted to be heard. Um, so, and I'm sure that's happened in, in a lot of other cities. It's just that my experience has been more with Kansas City. Um, I know that we had crews who were out for eight and 10 hours at a time who were legitimately fearing for their own safety as targets in the media, potential targets. 
thankfully, um, nothing has happened to any of our team other than the fact that everybody got pepper sprayed at one point, which is not a pleasant thing to happen to anyone. Um, you know, so it's definitely something that you can tell when there's an effort made to allow people to assemble, to allow people to have those voices heard in what that can look like. So um, as you mentioned, Dr. Carpenter, the, the quick reaction um, at least maybe gives us some hope that, that there are some positive things to come. Um, I wanna take one more opportunity to touch base with Denisa, Denisha rather, and um, see what other questions we might have. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Facebook that says, what can people of color do to protect and seek help for mental health related to trauma brought on by recent political and health crises? Keanu, I'm certain you on that, yeah. Sure, if you are fortunate to have coverage, of course you have a range of options with respect to both public and private mental health practitioners uh, from psychiatry uh, who, uh, or physicians that prescribe uh, medications for your uh, mental health, all the way to clinical social workers, psychologists, and what, what have you. Uh, if you are not covered uh, or uninsured, uh, then you have what's called our community mental health centers or community behavioral health centers um, in Kansas City uh, that includes uh, Swolf Health, uh, that includes um, Rediscover Mental Health Services, Comprehensive Mental Health Services, Samuel U. Rogers, and Truman Behavioral Health. Um, and they also, many of them have services on the Kansas side as well, and also Vibrant Health in Kansas. So those are a few organizations that if you're uninsured, you can um, seek um, help for you and your family for mental health care. And Kiana, wouldn't you say that if you're not sure where to start, um, a good place to start might be your county health department? I agree. You can call your county health department. Um, you can call um, ComCare Behavioral Health. I'm sorry, I don't have that number memorized, uh, but you can call them and they can direct you in terms of information and referral. We know that navigating the mental health care system can be very challenging and um, that not one size fits all. Um, you talked a little bit about how in particular black Americans may be treated differently by the system than um, their white counterparts. And in terms of, I, I found it interesting that you were talking not only in terms of just the interaction, but also who gets medication, who gets counseling, um, and the accessibility of those kinds of things. Denise? <laughs> Kiana, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? I, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So, yes, there have been several studies that have taken a look at access to care, even when a Black person has the ability to pay. And so there was a study that was published, I believe, in 2016 that took a look at um, what happened when Black folks and white folks who had the ability to pay had the exact same insurance called um, a psychotherapist in order to schedule an appointment. 28% of white folks were offered an appointment, whereas a significantly smaller number of black folks were offered an appointment um, and were denied service. There was another research study that came out, and I can't remember who published this one, that also showed that when black men call to speak with a psychotherapist who is not black, um, they were often offered appointments that were inconvenient for their schedule. Um, and so there are several things that researchers have proposed there. One of which is that the therapist communicated that they didn't find that black people were self-reflective and they wouldn't necessarily go through the therapeutic process to integrate the material. They also assumed that they wouldn't show up on time. All of these kinds of stereotypes and assumptions that people make. When Kiana talked about medical um, care and medical trauma, it's the idea of when I go to see a physician, I am concerned if they're even going to believe 
what I am saying. I, I'm concerned about that as a Black person and how I'll be treated. And then we also know that women, right? So there's this compounding intersectional effect that women's complaints are deemed, you know, as psychological in the head. Oh, have you experienced stress? You know, no more than usual, where it's written off as something of that sort. Um, and when you count poverty into that, there's obviously the idea of, you know, sliding scale, um, providers who have sliding scales, good luck getting in to see them anytime soon. And there's also the idea of even if I do get in to see you, are you a culturally competent and responsive person who I can have this real conversation with about the experiences that I am having? And so to the questioner's point about what can you do, if you are in an affinity group like a fraternity or sorority, you need to be talking with them about planting a healing circle within your local community of like-minded folks who you can gather with in order to validate each other, to reflect on the real experiences you are having and to talk that stuff out because the worst thing we can do is to bottle it up because it's going to come out in some way. Do the same for your church environment and those types of things. So in many ways, you have to create the healing spaces that you need um, so that we can be well and good for ourselves as well as the people around us. We wow. just this week at Fox 4 did a story that I found fascinating. Um, about a local apparel company that launched a new line and their whole mission, it's called, I had to look it up, Made Mob. And their whole mission was to donate the proceeds from this new apparel line that they have specifically to provide counseling services for black Americans with black therapists, with people who look like them, with people who would understand on a different level their uniquenesses, their needs. Um, and I just thought that was really, um, you know, you think of it on the surface and it's like, oh, this is a nice story about a little local apparel company doing something. But I think it's exactly an example of the kind of leadership that all of you have spoken about in terms of what can you do to put yourself in a position to affect that change. Um, I do want to call out, Jana, you make a, a, an exceptional point that's often overlooked is the importance of representation of black and brown people uh, in healthcare disciplines and in the health sciences, not just physicians and nurses, uh, but also you know, um, techs, researchers, um, the, whole, the whole gamut, um, predictive modelers, analysts, all those individuals that um, are upstream and downstream to care outcomes are vastly important. Um, I do want to give a shout out uh, to some solutions that are right here in Kansas City and what I believe are jewels uh, in uh, the crown of Kansas City in this space, and that's the Blueford Healthcare Leadership Institute. Uh, the founder and CEO is John Blueford, the uh, CEO Emeritus of Truman Medical Centers, who has a leadership development program right here in Kansas City every summer uh, for black and brown scholars who are at institutions all across the country, about 30%-ish, give or take, are from Kansas City. He brings them here, or they bring them here every summer, and they place them um, in healthcare roles and disciplines all throughout the country. So it's these types of programs and models that need to be scaled uh, so that we can ensure uh, that we have a pipeline of black and brown um, individuals in healthcare disciplines. If I can add one additional resource, and thank you for stating that about what's happening in KC. So for folks who are having a struggle with getting out for whatever reason, right now you don't feel comfortable going out to gather and or you don't have the technology or whatever the case may be, um, on the go, the Liberate app, Liberate is an app that does mindfulness for Black folks and people of color. A lot of the folks who are providing the um, mindfulness sessions are Black. They're pre-recorded. I use them all the time. One of my colleagues at Alive and Well recommended to me. There are free uh, features of it as well as a very low cost um, subscription. I don't get any kickbacks for recommending that. I just know that it's been incredibly helpful to me as I manage my own responses to the moment that we're in. That sounds like a great resource. Thank you, Denise, for sharing that. 
um, kind of taken a quick look at my notes to see where we need to go from here. Our time is slipping away from us more quickly than I'm sure any of us would like. But uh, Denisha, I'll refer back to you because there may be some pressing uh, questions that you have seen coming in through Facebook or through uh, the website. Yes, so there is a um, teacher here in the city that says that they are actively working to use restorative justice in order to give our students a voice rather than using discipline that has been the fallback. Can you speak to the need to change laws that dictate how schools react to students and discipline? Dr. Carpenter, I'm gonna throw that one to you. And I guess the first thing I'll ask you to do is talk to us about what restorative uh, therapy is and, and what that looks like in the schools. So, so discipline is about um, strict accountability and punishment for behavior. Restorative is about, do you really, really want to change the behavior? And how can a child make things right? So when you think about restorative practices in school, you're talking about providing opportunities for children to engage around a, an infraction. You talk about creating a space for a child to face their accuser. And you're talking about having a clear plan to make certain that a child can make that situation right. And the research is becoming pretty overwhelming on restorative practices being so much better than traditional discipline as it relates to a child being a repeat offender or not. So what we're finding is that when a child has to face his or her accuser, hear their voice, and then make that situation right, whether that be a student, whether that be a teacher who heard them, something that didn't align itself with the code of conduct, they have to make it right. So restorative practice, that body of research is deepening and deepening. It does make a difference and those policy shifts need to take place. Unfortunately, unfortunately, traditional discipline is held up because in most cases, and I've sat in the assistant principal desk and I reflected on those five years as an assistant principal and I always thought, who am I doing this for? Am I putting this child in out of school suspension or in school suspension for the child or am I doing it for the teacher, the adult? And those are the conversations that have to take place among faculty and staff in a place called school. Because if Denise is the teacher and she just wants this child out of her hair right now, then let's have that conversation. And let's talk about what that can look like in a way that doesn't remove a child from his or her education. But if it's really about changing behavior and changing outcomes, then we know restorative practices are more effective than traditional discipline. So those are those courageous conversations that building leaders need to be willing to have with their staff. Unfortunately, when it becomes more about a job than taking care of young people, we are afraid to enter into that conversational space with teachers. And I, was, I, I can say that as a 25 year old assistant principal with 40 and 50 and maybe even 60 year old teachers, none of which look like me, I probably played that game more than I care to talk about. But when I learned better, I did better. And now that we all know better, we all should be doing better in that area. Do you think, Dr. Carpenter, that we're, we're doing enough to equip the people who are in those roles and in the schools to be able to navigate that? I mean, I know there's a there's a black and white policy written, but there's a lot of gray area that needs to be discussed. And it seems to me that there are times when administrators feel bound by the rules and the, the black and white of it all. No, so, so the, the thing about rules in a place called school is they're socially constructed. Put another way, they're constructed by the people in positions of power in that organization in most cases. Now, granted, you got the seven deadly sins that are coming down from the state level related to violence and the like, and they're, they are pretty black and white. But most policies around discipline in school, Jana, they're socially constructed by the people in the school setting. And if they're socially constructed, that means they can be socially deconstructed. See, when we need policy to shift to marginalized groups, we start talking about the fixed nature of that policy. But when the policy doesn't work for the majority culture, man, that policy is so malleable. I mean, it's like clay. That policy, can, that policy can move around. But when we need it to bend toward black folks, brown folks, and poor folks, it's fixed. 
it's in stone. But we got to really, really have the right people asking the right questions about things that are socially constructed. They can be deconstructed. All of that. <laughs> and I think what we are seeing in classrooms, so let's name this reality as well. What we are seeing in our classrooms is also a manifestation of the harm that's been caused to our community. When you have so many black fathers who are imprisoned, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, right? When you have families that have to work two to three shifts to make ends meet, right? And leaving children um, unsupervised or less than optimally supervised. When you have people who are nested in toxic stress and trauma, they're experiencing racism in the curricula, they're experiencing racist interactions in the school building from their peers, and let's be real, also from their educators. You are seeing a manifestation of the ways in which we are relatively sick in our society. And again, I go back to root cause. We have to give people what we gave. And, you know, when you talk about the truth divide in KC, we have the Del Mar divide right here in St. Louis. So the people on the good side of the track of the divide, we have to give the people on this side who are hurting the same thing that we deprive them of if we want to get a different result. So what you're seeing in the school is a microcosm of the harm that we've caused. And then we want to punish the kids for showing up the way that we have conditioned them and deprived them to be. Deanna, how do you think we can better equip our school counselors, our school administrators to be able to be agents of change that we need them to be in our school systems? Oh, I think you're muted at the moment. Oh, sorry. It has a lot to do with resourcing and making sure schools are resourced appropriately. Dr. Carpenter spoke um, about making sure that there is an equity lens applied to resourcing. Look at your data about your student demographic and the uh, look for the adverse experiences and conditions that's present in your student body and make sure that the composition of your clinical teams and staff at the school level, number one, make sure that the clinical teams and staff are in the schools, making sure that they're resourced appropriately in number um, and in competency to deal with what, the, what issues are present. Um, so that's first and foremost in terms of resourcing. The other thing is uh, Medicaid expansion. So that's a systemic issue that has a direct implication or impact on school-based mental health services. So school-based mental health services are reimbursable services uh, and expanding Medicaid uh, by voting uh, yes on Amendment 2 on August 4th will have a direct impact on school-based mental health care. I'm a parent in the um, Olathe, Kansas School District and our most diverse school is Olathe North, the original high school. And I found it really interesting that when the district made a commitment a couple of years ago to provide um, counseling services um, through a partnership with Friends University and their clinical uh, students, that they were finding that none of the parents were declining any opportunities when they were offered within the school um, to remove the barriers of parents having to take off work, having to take a child to an appointment, um, I thought there might have been more resistance to assistance when um, the educators and the people who see those children every day identify someone who needs a boost and, and needs assistance. I, I just thought there would be some hesitation on the parents' part, but they found that unequivocally the parents were all in and said, absolutely, you know, get my kid help to the point that they're overwhelmed and need more assistance to be able to do that. Um, I would also add really quickly, because I forgot from a student-centric perspective, Jana, um, and making sure that, they, that, that kids of color have resource groups, especially in urban districts. So I'm raising two uh, black girls in Johnson County, uh, where they are dealing with the issues of not only racism uh, in their school, which is in every school, not just in Johnson County, 
in the, in the suburbs, but also colorism, as Denisha talked about earlier in terms of this black on black or self-hatred uh, and this caste system that's been established among the black communities in terms of the color of our skin, the hue of our skin. Uh, there is an all out assault on uh, black and brown children in the suburbs uh, and the level of stress that they are enduring just to show up as black and brown kids in white districts is traumatic. Um, and it is a part of our daily conversation uh, in my home um, and all the way down to uh, the black boys don't like me uh, and they are black girls. Uh, the black girls like the white girls. That's a whole white supremacy, centering whiteness, centering that, centering white beauty as the standard of beauty, um, which is a, an attack on the black girl's psyche. So there's so much that schools need to be considering, especially predominantly white schools who are educating and um, uh, providing a safe space as they should be um, educationally, physically, and mentally and emotionally for students of color. And certainly a point well taken that, um, you know, no child can learn and be effective in the classroom and no teacher can be an effective teacher if we've got a bunch of kids dealing with mental health issues that haven't been addressed because what kind of distraction does that cause for everyone. Um, I know Denisha had a few uh, extra questions from our audience this evening. Yes. Um... Considering the systemic and often cultural historical roots of poverty, what can institutional leaders do, if anything, to change our trajectory? Should we just accept that there will always be poor people and there will always be trauma? Yeah. Um, That's a big one. We ask this question in context of us being the richest nation in the world. Nobody's going to ride their horses and come in and overthrow us, right? We ask this question in context of social services and supports to the people of our country being a minuscule part of our national budget compared to say defense, right? Or offense, depending on how you wanna look at that. Should we, the people, continue to accept those priorities? And the answer is obviously no, but do we see it as our responsibility to disrupt that prioritization? If we continue to say again, that you can decide which portions of the American population you're gonna leave behind, there will always be trauma and it's gonna get worse, much worse, and there will always be poverty. I always ask the question, and I, I posed this question before to social workers, what would you do if racial inequity for black folk were to stop? So, police brutality ended, Black folk had the resources that they needed in order to not only make ends meet, but to provide enrichment opportunities for their kids. We're resilient people. We're going to be all right. So the answer is the majority of us would be just fine, right, with this weight off of us. But there will still be people that need the healing. I think people underestimate the experience to which Black folk have been harmed in this country, the number of Black people who cry every day, sometimes several times a day, who console their children around the trauma that's being experienced. So here's the answer to that. Yes, everybody needs to understand the reality of our history and how it pays forward as the foundation that we are on right now. But you know what, that's just the, that's the entry point. We've spent a lot of time trying to convince people that, oh, you have to know the history and you gotta spend 12 weeks in a class and then maybe you'll be ready to do some work. Here's the thing, you got the subject matter experts around you. So Dennis, Denise, and Kiana, you got a whole bunch of them in your organization, ask them. You don't have to be the leader of this thing whether you're black and you're not sure if you can leverage your power in that way or you're white step aside and listen to black folks 
Again, we have to change the narrative on who you can leave behind, and the answer is nobody. And we all have to find our moral courage to call BS on BS. We have to be willing to be unpopular. And if we do that enough as a choir, it suddenly becomes a thing that other people are willing to do because they have the wind at their back in all of us who are speaking up at the same time. I hope that makes sense. Denise, you're my hero. <laughs> well, I sure do appreciate you, sister. <laughs> As many of you know, who have joined an American Public Square event in the past, um, we like to allow our panelists to have a final comment. And we do that in a form that looks like this. We ask the questions, so what? And now what? So Kiana, I'm gonna start with you this evening and let you answer the questions of, so what? And now what? Uh, so what is, um, we all are accountable um, for what we've seen and what we've experienced. And so the question is, so what are we going to do about it? Um, how are we going to use our spheres of influence in whatever um, circles that we occupy, whatever roles that we occupy, whatever relationships that we have to um, affect anti-racist behaviors and anti-traumatic experiences? And as we've talked about, those two things are inextricably tied um, in our country. And so the now what for me is looking at policy at a very systemic level at community levels, state levels, federal levels, holding um, not just our elected officials accountable, but each other accountable for who we elect. Um, and I agree with Dr. Carpenter in that uh, protest in our communities have always um, facilitated change. And so I fully support uh, the protest, uh, the rainbow of protests that we see um, out there in our communities. And without those protests, we won't have change. I'm 100% behind them. I only ask that they further that and take it from the streets to the boardroom, from the streets to the, board, to the voting block, and use a level of strategy uh, around um, their, their aims, around their influence. Kiana, thanks. Dr. Carpenter, I turn to you with so what and now what. So what and now what? Um, it, this has been a great show, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity. While while we we've been here, I had a little watch party going on on my other screen, and <laughs> someone on that screen said um, that they needed some recommendations around childhood trauma books. So I want to lean into that a little bit as I raise a little black boy and a little black girl. Um, there's Rosenstein's work. It happened to me. It happened to me as a children's book, Arthur by the last name, name of Rosenstein. And then there's the Latasha Perry series, the Like Mind series. And that series is Hair Like Mine, Skin Like Mine, and that's Latasha Perry. So I wanted to offer that to a principal, I think he's from Georgia, who wanted that recommendation. Um, I'll conclude with this statement. Dr. King, said in the 60s prior to his, his death, he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And I think for too long, we have wanted that arc to, to bend all on its own. And I always thought about that because I studied King from back in high school. I just became a fan. And then even on my own independent study in college. So I was really, really, refresh when President Obama came along and in one of his many eloquent, eloquent speeches, he said, he brought up that moral arc, that arc of the moral universe. He said, but what King didn't tell you is that it doesn't bend on its own. It takes all of us pushing. So what I would encourage all of our listeners and viewers to do is just put your hand on that moral arc in this moment wherever you think you can influence that art best. But what you can't do is not put one hand or two hands on that art. What you can't do is sit back and wait for others to push it. Everyone has a responsibility to push that moral art. That's all I have. Dr. Carpenter, thank you. 
that leaves us with you, Denise, to answer our questions of so what and now what. Wow, A, that's incredibly powerful. And thank you for adding that into the atmosphere for sure. So what, now what? So we know that trauma is pervasive. And while we have centered racialized trauma here, we know that trauma cuts across socioeconomic demographics as well as race. But what we do mean when we talk about racialized trauma is that your race and your skin color, if you are white, and close to white may not be a factor for you and your development and how your wellness and health is impacted, right? Trauma is pervasive. Racialized trauma affects more people than it does others. So now what? We got to get busy. Let me change that. We got to get productive. We have to set real metrics and change. And guess what? I can talk about in five years as Denise, I'm going to do this, this, and the other around racial inequity and anti-racism. I need my white friends, allies, and co-conspirators and good white folks to decide when enough is enough. What can you do with your power in 30 days, 90 days, 60 days, a year, and get about the business of making it happen? For organizational leaders, I offer this resource. There's a book by Kathy O'Bear called But I'm Not Racist, Tools for Well-Meaning Whites. You can find it on amazon.com. And the last thing I will offer is a lot of the not-for-profit world is built upon the suffering of black people. It's built upon the suffering of brown people, that deprivation. I need to us to envision a world where we spend our time and our philanthropy making people whole. And so far, we've been serving the dysfunction that our system has created. So I meet those in the not-for-profit world who are doing collective impact work and the like to get about the real business of implementing racial equity and anti-racism. Thank you, Denise. Wow, everyone's parting thoughts are just kind of settling in. I think that may take some time, but I certainly appreciate each one of you. I want to thank our panelists again, and, and thank you on behalf of everyone who joined us this evening, Denise Long, Dr. Dennis Carpenter, and Kiana Thompson. Um, I think you've helped us unpack a lot, um, hopefully give us some things to ruminate on over the next few days and weeks. Um, I think this conversation has left all of us, hopefully, more enlightened and certainly enriched. Um, so with that, I will turn things back over to Denisha Snell as we wrap up our evening. Thank you. Thank you again to our panelists, moderator, and fact checkers. This has been a fabulous conversation. To those of you in the audience, Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us in this important discussion. There were lots of questions that we were not able to get to tonight. Just know that um, we will do our best to get those questions answered by some of our panelists. Um, and, and we saw you and we wanna acknowledge that we saw your questions. You can learn more about this series as well as access the fact sheet and mental health resources at our website, americanpublicsquare.org. Tomorrow morning, we will be sending out a short post-event survey, and I ask that you please take a few moments to fill it out. Your feedback helps us plan our events, and it's greatly appreciated. And remember, if you have liked what you've seen this evening, and you are not already an American Public Square member, please join today and take advantage of our summer promotion to give a gift of membership to a friend. Thank you again, and have a great evening. Bye-bye.